Good morning. I'm Father Tom Malionic. I'm the rector of St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Kinderhook, New York. Today is Sunday, May 24th. It is the seventh Sunday of Easter. So this morning we are going to pray the Office of Morning Prayer from the 1979 Book of Common Prayer of the Episcopal Church. And if you are joining us on Facebook, whether you're joining us live or watching the video, uh, if you'd like to participate, if you'd like to follow along uh, with the responses and the congregational parts of the service, you'll find information on that in the text header to the video. And there are some links there that will take you to resources that will help you do that as well. Um, if you would like to do this on a more regular basis, if you'd like to find out uh, what else is in the Bible, if you would like to uh, to join us for prayers or to find out what's in our prayer book, please just be in touch with me. You can leave a message in the comments section and, and uh, let me know how to get in touch with you. And I'll be happy to make sure that we can get those resources to you as well. I should point out that since today is, is our Sunday worship and that uh, since... Uh, we can't be together to celebrate the Eucharist, to celebrate Mass. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the Eucharist is the source and the center of Christian life and has been since the various early, very earliest days of the Church. That, in order to, to remain um, consistent with our, our readings so that when we do get back together, we'll be in sync, we're using the Scripture passages and the Psalm from the Eucharistic lectionary and not from the... Um, not from the lectionary for morning prayer. So that's the one, the one uh, difference you may notice in uh, what we do this morning. Uh, but if you don't have a Book of Common Prayer, or if the online resources aren't working for you, uh, it's also perfectly legitimate if you would just like to listen, uh, just like to let the words of the prayer book and the words of the scripture wash over you. Uh, they are God's words after all, and we are involved in this, this wonderful eternal conversation with a God who is eternally present to us and eternally faithful to us, even though we tend to lose sight of that fact from time to time. But this is our opportunity to really uh, be intentionally and uh, deliberately and consciously part of that conversation. And these words that, that were written down so many thousands of years ago are nevertheless fresh and new and personally directed at us in our own day and age as well. Um, they are uh, spoken directly to us. They're spoken directly to you, whether whether it's in a whisper or whether it's in a shout, nevertheless. They have something to say. God has something to say to you today. And if, if we will just pay attention and listen, we will find that that, that voice uh, is louder and more trustworthy than all the other voices that uh, that swirl around us and the voices inside ourselves. In order to enable us to pay attention to God in this conversation, I would invite you at this point to uh, perhaps disconnect uh, or to um, turn down the sound on your, on your cell phone or your TV set. Uh, and uh, in addition to the, the external distractions that we can control, we'll take a moment and allow God to, to spread peace over the internal distractions, the thoughts of our minds and the emotions in our hearts and the restlessness of our bodies. And then we'll begin with our prayers. Christ has entered, not into a sanctuary made with hands, a copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to set forth his praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things that are necessary for our life and our salvation, and so that we may prepare ourselves in heart and mind to worship him, let us compose ourselves in silence, and with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins, that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways 
to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. On page 83, Christ our Passover. Alleluia. Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Alleluia. Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, Alleluia. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Alleluia. Psalm 68, verses 1 through 20, followed by verses 33 through 36, found beginning on page 676 in the Book of Common Prayer. Let God arise, and let his enemies be scattered. Let those who hate him flee before him. Let them vanish like smoke when the wind drives it away. As the wax melts at the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. Let them also be merry and joyful. Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Exalt him who rides upon the heavens. Yahweh is his name. Rejoice before him. Father of orphans, defender of widows, God in his holy habitation. God gives the solitary a home and brings forth prisoners into freedom. But the rebels shall live in dry places. O God, when you went forth before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth shook and the skies poured down rain at the presence of God, the God of Sinai, at the presence of God, the God of Israel. You sent a gracious rain, O God, upon your inheritance. You refreshed the land when it was weary. Your people found their home in it. In your goodness, O God, you have made provision for the poor. The Lord gave the word. Great was the company of women who bore the tidings. Kings with their armies are fleeing away. The women at home are dividing the spoils. Though you lingered among the sheepfolds, you shall be like a dove whose wings are covered with silver, whose feathers are like green gold. When the Almighty scattered kings, it was like snow falling in Zalman. O mighty mountain, O hill of Bashan, O rugged mountain, O hill of Bashan, why do you look with envy, O rugged mountain, at the hill which God chose for his resting place? Truly, the Lord will dwell there forever. The chariots of God are twenty thousand, even thousands of thousands. The Lord comes in holiness from Sinai. You have gone up on high and led captivity captive. You have received gifts even from your enemies, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Blessed be the Lord day by day, the God of our salvation, who bears our burdens. He is our God, the God of our salvation. God is the Lord, by whom we escape death. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth, sing praises to the Lord. He rides in the heavens, the ancient heavens. He sends forth his voice 
his mighty voice. Ascribe power to God. His majesty is over Israel. His strength is in the skies. How wonderful is God in his holy places, the God of Israel giving strength and power to his people. Blessed be God. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles, the first chapter, the sixth through the fourteenth verses. When they had come together, the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these were with all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers here ends the reading on page 85 canticle 8 the song of moses i will sing to the lord for he is lofty and uplifted the horse and its rider has he hurled into the sea the Lord is my strength and my refuge. The Lord has become my Savior. This is my God, and I will praise him, the God of my people, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a mighty warrior. Yahweh is his name. The chariots of Pharaoh and his army has he hurled into the sea. The finest of those who bear armor have been drowned in the Red Sea. The fathomless deep has overwhelmed them. They sank into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in might. Your right hand, O Lord, has overthrown the enemy. Who can be compared with you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, awesome in renown, and worker of wonders? You stretched forth your right hand. The earth swallowed them up. With your constant love, you led the people you redeemed. With your might, you brought them in safety to your holy dwelling. You will bring them in and plant them on the mount of your possession. The resting place you have made for yourself, O, L o Lord, the sanctuary, O Lord, that your hand has established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the first letter of Peter, the fourth chapter, beginning at the twelfth verse, through the fifth chapter, ending at the eleventh verse. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you, upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice, insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God 
rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if, it be, if it is, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, like the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Here ends the reading. On page 92, Canticle 16, the Song of Zechariah. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant, David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father, Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 17th chapter, the 1st through the 11th verses. When Jesus had spoken to his disciples at the Passover meal, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. 
I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Here ends the reading. On page 96, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. On page 98, the suffrages form B. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day we bless you. We praise your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy on us, Lord, have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy, for we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope, and we shall never hope in vain. O God, the King of glory, you have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. Do not leave us comfortless, but send us your Holy Spirit to strengthen us, and exalt us to that place where our Savior Christ has gone before, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God in glory everlasting. Amen. <coughs> in continuing the third prayer in our novena, uh, our Advent, our ascens Ascension to Pentecost novena, uh, the prayer for understanding. Come, O Spirit of understanding, and enlighten my mind, that I may know and believe all of the mysteries of salvation, and discern your hand at work in the world. Teach me to see with your eyes, that I may apply my heart unto wisdom in this life, and be made worthy to attain to the vision glorious in the life to come. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Father, one God in trinity of persons and unity of being, now and forever. Amen. O God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Give us this day such blessing through our worship of you that the week to come may be spent in your favor. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
at the top of page 101, the prayer for mission. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross, that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you. For the honor of your name. Amen. And now, brothers and sisters, God knows all of our needs. God knows all of the desires of our hearts, the thoughts of our minds. But what we need to know is that we can stand before God, known so deeply, so thoroughly, that we can stand securely before the Lord of the universe and with confidence in his mercy and hope, deliberately and, and openly reveal to him and acknowledge ourselves those things that are, are most important to us. We'll take a moment to do that and to, to be personally in the presence of God, fully, fully exposed to him, and then we'll return to our common prayers as well. Lord, in our parish cycle of prayer, we lift up to you, Lynn, the residents and staff of the Grand at Barnwell, Rose, Rick, Teresa, the residents and staff of the Fireman's Home of Hudson, Stark, Lisa, Brian, Dave, Brendan, Glenn, Tom, Oakley, the residents and staff of the Pine Haven Nursing Home, John, Ann, Jay, the residents and staff of the Rosewood Nursing Home, and all who have asked for our prayers or for whom our prayers have been asked. We ask you, Lord, to bless with your favor all who are celebrating birthdays, anniversaries, and other milestones this week, especially Ron Malionic and Millie Sandman. We remember all who have died on the dates of this coming week, especially Ann Alder, Rose Wallace, Brian Beisel, Marie Demura, Harold Lansing, Clayton Drobner, Jean Kendall Thomas Clark, Warren Deal, and Ray, Fo Ray Foster. Those who have died in the communion of your church and also, Lord, those whose faith is known to you alone. In your mercy, O Lord, grant immediate, complete, and permanent healing to all who are sick or injured or suffering in body or mind, emotions or spirit from any cause. And halt, Lord, the spread of infections and contagion. Bless, protect, and show favor to doctors, nurses, first responders, and all who by their presence and labor contribute to the care of the sick and the provision of medical care. Lord, crown with success the efforts of all who are researching vaccines and treatments and grant them ingenuity, creativity, perseverance, and adequate resources. Relieve the burden of isolation from all who suffer from it, be it physically or spiritually, emotionally or financially. Lord, provide for their needs, and restore and sustain their hope. Deliver, Lord, and liberate all who are beset by evil and malicious spirits. O judge of the nations, we remember before you with grateful hearts the men and women who, in the day of decision, ventured much for blessings, for the blessings of a secure nation, and who gave their lives while serving in the armed forces. Grant us not to rest until all the people of this land share the benefits for which they fought and died and gladly accept its disciplines. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In our diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for our Bishop, Bill, and our, and our retired Bishop, Dan, and for the spiritual vitality of every missionary outpost of our diocese, starting with our own. We pray today for all members of the Anglican Communion around the world, 
We pray for the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Most Reverend Justin Welby, for all primates and bishops, for the Anglican Consultative Council and its members, for the Secretary General of the Anglican Communion, the Most Reverend Dr. Josiah Idowu Fieron, for the staff of the Anglican Communion Office in London, and for the staffs of the Anglican Communion Offices at the headquarters of the United Nations in Geneva and in New York City. Holy Spirit of God, you have poured your love into our hearts and granted us a diversity of gifts for the building up of your Holy Church. Come to us now in power and stir up those gifts among your faithful people at St. Paul's Church and in the Diocese of Albany, that we may, without shame, fear, or fatigue, announce to those around us the good news of your coming kingdom, and that we in our common life bear winsome witness to the same, that the world may know that you are making all things new, and that we are your disciples. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Father, ever one God. Amen. And Lord, we also bring before you our thanksgivings. We thank you, Lord, for all of our brothers and sisters in Christ, and especially those who join us online for prayers. We thank you for all who, by their words and by the witness of their lives, are promoting the spread of the gospel in our community and who are deepening the life in Christ of their families and friends and co-workers and neighbors. We thank you for all who, by their material contributions, are sustaining the mission and vocation of this parish and of this diocese and of your one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And now, brothers and sisters, I invite you to take a moment to um, reflect a little bit again, to recall back on the, recall the scripture readings that, that we had, the passages from, uh, from Acts, from the Acts of the Apostles, from the first letter of Peter and from the gospel according to John, and just to reflect upon them for a moment. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There is a word that runs like a golden thread through all of the scripture passages that we heard this morning. It runs like, um, there's that wonderful expression in, in, in the Book of Wisdom, the Wisdom of Solomon, runs like a fire through stubble. And the word that that golden word, that, that bright and shining word is the word glory. What is this glory that Jesus is talking about, that, that Peter writes about, that Luke writes about in the Acts of the Apostles over and over again? Jesus tells his father, he says, I glorified you. I glorified you. I made people aware of your glory. I showed your glory to them. And how did he do that? I glorified you, Father, by having accomplished the work you gave me to do. What work was that? Well, Jesus was a carpenter. That was work. He must have made some pretty glorious furniture in his day. <clears throat> he did other things that, that are glorious, certainly from, from our own perspective. They're wondrous. They're miracles. He fed multitudes, thousands of people on, on tiny little contributions. He turned water into wine, not just water, but dirty wash water into wine at a wedding. He healed the sick. He 
He raised the dead. He cleansed lepers. He cast out demons. He debated with Satan, and he won. He helped fishermen pull in huge catches of fish where there had been no fish before. He calmed the wind and the rains and storms. He restored the temple to its purpose as a house of prayer for all people. He forgave sins. He gave living water to weary, cynical souls. And he rescued from, from judgment people who were themselves cast aside because of their sins. And now here he is at the end of his life, and he's summarizing it all right in front of his friends with whom he is having dinner for the last time. And he's praying, and it's a long prayer. It goes on for several chapters in John's Gospel. But what does Jesus mean when he says, I glorified you by accomplishing the work you gave me to do? What work was it that glorified his Father on earth? Out of all the things that we could mention, out of all the things I just enumerated, all the things I thought of, all of the things that seem great to us, what is it that Jesus considers that glorifying work? I manifested your name. I gave them the words that you gave me. That's the work that his father gave Jesus to do. That's what Jesus thinks glory is all about. And no, that did not bring him the kind of earthly glory that his miracles and his healings did. He was widely acclaimed for a while because of them, but that glory faded pretty quickly. In the end, all but a, a very small handful, all but a few, turned away from him. And not a few turned on him. In the end, only a few remained faithful. And even of those who remained faithful, some of them still kind of scratched their heads and, and wondered and had their doubts. But then the Holy Spirit would fill them. And the Holy Spirit would not make sense of their doubts. The Holy Spirit would not explain to him why all of this is perfectly reasonable and rational and logical. But rather, the Holy Spirit would redirect their priorities, would redirect their lives, so that they kept their focus on following Jesus. They kept their focus on repeating the words that he spoke, because those are the words that his Father spoke to him. They immersed themselves in the study of the scriptures of the word of God. They kept their, they, the, the Holy Spirit transformed them in such a way that, that they were less worried about being certain about details and facts of what God would do and when would God do it than in the fact simply that Jesus Christ was his son and that he was trustworthy and worthy to be followed, even if we don't understand where he's taking us, even if we don't understand the path by which he is leading us. There will be many others down through history who would reject Jesus because he didn't meet their standards of acceptability, because he didn't make sense to them, because his teachings were bizarre or too challenging or seemed harsh. There would be people down through history who would reframe Jesus so that they would spare themselves the need to be transformed so fundamentally and radically so that they would not have to have their minds turned inside out and upside down so that they would not have to learn the logic of heaven even though it is more enduring and more glorious than the logic of earth. But there will always be, and there always have been, those who are invaded by the Holy Spirit and who, despite failures, despite falling, pick themselves back up with his help and get back on their feet and follow him again because they keep being drawn by his promise. They keep being drawn by the life he offers them. That's where the glory is. That's that life in abundance that he has promised to give us. That life in abundance, which is, as St. Irenaeus of Leon wrote in, in the third century, 
is, is the glory of God. People who are that abundantly alive, that they are not phased by the changes and chances of this life, that they are not bothered by circumstance, but instead find their peace and their solace, regardless of, of how enticing and, and seductive and alluring their circumstances are, regardless of how miserable their circumstances are, so that they are not spending their lives either trying to preserve and to keep what they have and not spending their lives trying to get out of what they have, but who instead simply keep their eyes fixed on the Lord, who keep their ears attuned to his word. That's where the glory is. Peter knew this. Peter was one of the ones who had, had gotten it wrong. Peter was one of the ones whose priorities really needed to change to the point where Jesus turned on him and said, look, that's the way Satan talks. That's not what I'm about. This is Peter who once he had been sifted, once he had had the doubt shaken out of him, not to be replaced by certitude, but simply to be replaced by a faith that says, where else can we go? These are the words of eternal life. Where can, where can we go except to follow them? This is Peter who, who would discover that, as Jesus predicted, once he had had that shaken out of him, once he had been sifted, his job would then be to help others make that same transition from trying to know to seeking to follow. Like St. Paul, St. Peter also does this by writing letters, although unlike Paul, he doesn't write to individual specific churches. He writes to all the churches. He sends circular, uh, circular letters, what we now call encyclical letter, letters, letters addressed to all the churches. And he knows how hard it is to make God's glory known. He knows how hard it is to get past our own enchantment with our own intellect. He knows how hard it is to get past our own belief that that because knowledge is power and power is what it's all about, therefore, what we really need is more knowledge. Peter knows that Christians are going to be derided as gullible or unintelligent or stupid or naive or maybe even mentally ill. It was already happening in his day. It has happened down through the centuries, even to our own day. And he knows how hard that is, and he knows how disconcerting and trying it can be. But he also knows that it doesn't last. And so he writes to all the churches to remind them that Jesus predicted this would happen. He tells them not to be surprised, that this isn't something strange happening to them. But that those who don't give in to the temptation to immediately abandon their posts because it's become difficult, those who don't give in to the temptation to try to find quick fixes to their problems, those who are not, not um, distracted by circumstances, whether wonderful circumstances or, or horrible circumstances, those who are not tempted to cut corners or to rush to easy solutions, but those who stay the course of faith following the person who is truth rather than the truths that they seem able to grasp that they are the ones who come out the other side with glory. They are the ones who discover what glory really means. And it is true of us no less today than it was for Jesus or for Peter or for the churches of the, the, the first few centuries when there were terrible persecutions or the church in missionary territories that did not receive the gospel readily or happily or gladly, but instead murdered the missionaries who who came to announce the good news of Jesus Christ. It has happened in every age and it happens for us now. But the fact is that really the thing that, that, that results in glory is, is that we have only one job and that is to glorify God. Our job is to, is to be as attentive and as dedicated as we can be to making sure that whatever we 
whatever we say, whatever we think, whatever we feel, whatever we believe, whoever we are, or whatever we do or refrain from doing, that, that we do it in such a way that it draws a clear connection between any of that and, and God, and that we do that in full view of the world around us, not off in a corner, not behind closed doors, but evidently, visibly, publicly, that where we do good, we make sure that the world knows that it is not we who are doing good. It is not because we are good. It's not to prove to ourselves that we're okay. It's not because we're worthy of praise. It's not because we have anything to boast of, but because God has made possible a love that does not come naturally to us which if we were left to our own devices and our own decisions, we would not exhibit. Our job is, is to make sure that even when we do not do good, even when we fall, that we make sure the world knows that that very same God who holds us accountable, who does not hesitate to point out our failings and our flaws and our faults to us is also the God who not only judges and separates good from evil and sacred from profane and holy from ordinary, but that the same God also has given us the gift, the opportunity, the privilege of repentance. The privilege of being able to confess and admit and be sorry for our faults and to be relieved of the shame and allowed to pick up and pick up where we left off even if the whole world should see our crimes, that repentance and mercy and forgiveness are always possible with this same God who always wants to keep lifting us up and keep setting us in the right direction, following the right truth, who is the person Jesus Christ, that this God is always desires, desiring to raise us up to the full stature of the mature Christ. How do we do this? The same way that Jesus did, the same way Peter did, that Paul did. Give people the words that the Father has given. Give people the words of God. The words that I gave you, says Jesus, not just the ones that you find endearing, but all of them, the whole of God's word in the Bible, give that to others because that's where I am. I am the truth. Not truths, but the truth. And the only truth that leads to glory. Tell them what I am doing, what I have been doing since the beginning. Tell them that even the defection of the human race has not deterred me, that I have not given up. People may turn from my love so fiercely that they make it impossible to, to see the love that I am showing them. And they make it impossible for me to show love in a way that, that doesn't feel like an imposition. And I will not do that, but I do not cease to love you. Testify to everyone and anyone about the great privilege of turning back to me time and time again, and of having faith in my son, Jesus Christ, as Lord. Give your own personal witness as to how, when your life was awful, when you had really blown it and you had no hope and you realized that there was no way out and that there was no way that you, or for that matter, anybody else around you was ever going to get it right, how you discovered the God who says that it's always possible to pick up and keep going. Tell the world about faith. Explain that it doesn't mean faith that God will do X, Y, or Z, or keep X, Y, or Z from happening, but simply that God is a trustworthy God, that God is a trustworthy lover, even if we can't see him at the moment, even if we can't see how at the moment, that God is worth keeping faith with. Brothers and sisters, we think that things that are happening to us now today are strange. We think that the world has changed. We're upset that we can't do the things we used to do, that we can't go where we used to go or see the people we used to see or wear what we want or even 
eat what we want, that we can't partake of the same comforts and the same pleasures. And so we are tempted to look for someone to blame and someone to excoriate, someone to hold responsible for our discomforts, someone who will, we can make them put, them put things back the way they used to be, the way we want them to be. But that's the same old temptation that Peter warns us again. It's that same ravening lion prowling around, waiting for somebody to give in, waiting for somebody who can be stirred to outrage or greed or envy or lust or paralysis or self-medication or smugness. And we meet that temptation the same way Christians have always met it, by making God's glory our primary concern, by immersing ourselves first and foremost in his word, but also in all of the means of grace that will draw us out of our self-indulgence, out of our preoccupations with our own rightness, with our own benefit, with our own advantage. Anything that will take us away from the focus on ourselves and on our own circumstances and restore us to the following of God. That's how we counter that temptation. So as we move forward into this week, I invite you to ask yourself, how will you glorify God this week? How will you be fully alive this week? How will you be so fully alive that your circumstances are secondary to you? How will you manifest his name and make it known and publicize it and cause others to know it? How will you connect the good things in your life to God? How will you connect the opportunity to pick up and move on after failure to God? What words of God has God given you in the scriptures to share with someone else this week? And again, not so that you will be appreciated for it. That's not the point. It may not be appreciated, but how will you glorify God because if you glorify God, God's glory rubs off on you. That, brothers and sisters, is what we are about. Whether we're together in person or here online, that's what we are about. And it is glorious. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Continuing now on page 101, the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for your immeasurable love, in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I want to thank you for, for joining us in prayer this morning. Um, there are a number of important announcements. Uh, if Since we are online, I'm, I'm kind of going to assume that most everybody is also subscribing to our epistle. If you don't, there's a link 
in the text header, you can get the epistle. Um, I just want to just want to review briefly a couple things that, uh, especially if you know someone that does not get the epistle that is not online, um, if you would um, be a good minister to them and call them and kind of fill them in and uh, urge and encourage them uh, to uh, to make themselves known so that we can make sure we do stay in touch with them. Uh, the vestry ha the vestry has been doing an excellent job of that. Um, they have been calling regularly. They have been touching base with people. They have been um, just making sure that everybody's okay. I have uh, praise and thanks be to God not heard of any uh, anyone in our own parish community uh, who has uh, tested positive even for COVID nineteen. So um, so we have been very blessed in that regard. Um, and in order to help us do that, in order to help us stay in touch with one another, um, we do have a parish directory. It is available, again, electronically uh, for free. And if you just let me know, uh, if you're a parishioner, it's available to parishioners. So if you are available, if you are interested in getting a copy, I can email a copy of that to you. Uh, if you want hard copy, um, those cost a little bit to prepare. And so um, we would ask for a donation towards that. If you um, if you would like a hard copy, though, if you know someone who would, please let me know, and uh, we'll make those arrangements. A lot of people have been asking about reopening churches, and there's been a lot of talk about that recently, a lot of news about that. Um, the picture keeps changing. We are waiting for guidance from the bishop, <clears throat> because the bishop is, uh, in the Episcopal Church, the chief liturgical authority in every diocese. And so even when we resume, we will do so under the conditions and, and, and in the ways that um, that the bishop will, will make clear to us. I understand that he's planning to issue some guidelines this coming week. Um, the fact, however, is that, that even when we do begin uh, meeting in person together, it will be a gradual process. We will need to make quite a few adaptations to make sure that we uh, respect and ensure the health and safety of of those who do come together in person. Um, and the, the other fact is that we will have to accept some losses. We will have to grieve some changes that will probably never go back to the way things were. Others will be easy enough to, to make the adjustment, um, but a great many of these will be for the long term. We will certainly be limited in the number of people that we can accommodate. Um, and certainly the, um, the church building where we are here at St. Paul's is a, a better space for that than the chapel, although it's going to be more uncomfortable in the hot summer months. Uh, but we have a better, we have a better uh, layout there so that we can ensure some, some uh, spacing of people out. We'll have to leave two pews, from what I understand, uh, between people so that uh, we make sure that we maintain a, a proper distance. Um, there's good reason to think that um, uh, we will not go back to congregational singing anytime soon, and we will certainly not go back to physical co contact at the uh, the sign of the peace. Um, there's really no need no need for us to come together in person unless we are going to celebrate mass. So when we do gather together in person, it will be for the Eucharist, but there will be additional steps taken again to make sure that that we keep everything as as infection free as possible. Uh, there will be restrictions on on how I consecrate the elements and how they are distributed. Um, all of those things will be made clear in, in due course. Um, probably the hardest thing for us here at St. Paul's is um, that we are going to have to accept the fact that we will not go back to having two services on Sunday. Um, there is simply no way for us to uh, either in terms of in terms of time or manpower or resources to be able to ensure that uh, a second group can come in uh, within a few, an hour or two of um, of a first group and expect to find a place that is that is safe, so we're going to have to deliberate on how to do that and what to do. Um, that's going to be, I know, at St. Paul's, a um, a difficult question to address, and so I would really ask that everybody, before we start weighing in with our ideas. Uh, that we take a long period of concerted prayer and reflection, and that especially um, I recommend to you an article, and there's a link to that article in the text header to this video uh, by the Gospel Coalition. It says, church, don't let corona, corona 
virus divide you? And it's a very good article, and I would like us to proceed with a common, with that common ground of understanding, um, so that we can refer back to that. Uh, finally, the other the other uh, announcement that I have uh, for us here this morning is that uh, we our office coordinator continues to serve us well, um, but she is severely hampered by the fact that uh, she cannot afford where she is to have internet service. And so trying to do everything on a tiny little cell phone screen is, is becoming very difficult. Uh, she is looking for a place. Also, the commute is a little bit difficult as well. So she's looking for a place closer to us here, uh, closer to the Kinderhook area, perhaps as far as Hudson, perhaps as far as East Greenbush or out to the sides. And uh, if you know of uh, uh, reasonable, reasonably priced and decent rental accommodations for her, um, please let me know so that we can help her uh, help her be part of our family in a, uh, a better and more productive way. And finally, uh, I continue to offer Monday through Friday morning prayer and evening prayer, um, nine in the morning and five in the evening, uh, live streamed on Facebook and then kept on YouTube. I also have the morning musings, which is a, a brief kind of meditation on the texts of the daily office. If you need uh, prayer, if you need spiritual guidance, uh, if you need other ministry, again, leave me a message, uh, get in touch anyway, all the different ways that, that are possible, and, uh, and I'll make sure that we connect. So again, I would just uh, invite you this week to glorify God, especially by being attentive to one another, uh, by being gracious and kind and gentle with one another, um, to make God's glory known to them, especially those who do not know Jesus Christ, those who have never cared, those who have avoided knowing him. Um, be the one who makes the introduction to him. Don't hog the glory for yourself. Let it be shared. Thank you. God bless you for the rest of the day today. And I, I look forward to seeing you again in person soon, God willing, but at least online. Mm -hmm.